Hi everyone, it's Kirk and Michael for this week's edition of The Rundown. We're a little bit late, a little behind. This one took a little while. It did, it's taken a little extra time, didn't it? <laughs> so, uh, Michael, I, I thought today would be, well, b before we start, I, 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 what I, I really wanted to make sure that everyone uh, who's watching today's rundown is aware of the last three rundowns we've done because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Toot our own horn for a minute. The last three rundowns may be uh, the best rundowns we've ever done, at least consecutively, that are applicable to the majority of everybody. It's not specific to gr groups of people that might have this strategy or might have this strategy. It really is broad, but really valuable. We've gotten tremendous feedback. Yeah, we have. And I, and I think you nailed it because that is what I think the reason is, is the last three rundowns are universally applicable. It is not just one right. small piece here or one lever there. The last three apply to everyone's plan. So the point of bringing this up is if you haven't watched the last three, go back and please watch the last three. And you need to watch them in order, if I remember correctly, because we kind of uh, set it up. Ideally. In, ideally, yeah. right? Okay. So the, the next thing, Michael, I know you wanted to touch on, we haven't done a market update in a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been fun to to watch the market. Uh, well, I don't know if fun is the right word, but it's been interesting at least. Michael, give us a general sense of where we're at and give us a market update. Sure, so we are roughly, uh, we're up roughly 18% year to date. I'm talking S&P 500 and today is August 31st. So we're up roughly 18% year to date. Okay. And that's coming off of the lows of 2022. So 2022, I'm sure most people remember, was a pretty nasty year for the stock market and the bond market. It was mostly a straight down all, most of the years, just straight, straight down. Now, we've, we're up 18% year to date. We are still about 5% off of all time highs. Okay. Meaning we're still about 5% away from the all time high of the stock market. So we're not all the way back to where we were at the peak, but we're getting pretty close. So it's interesting, Michael, because, um, and I wanted you to explain that. So when we say all time highs, people, they hear up, the market up 18% this year, right. right? But we still haven't yet achieved and uh, eclipsed the all-time high that we hit in mm -hmm. 2021. It was uh, or, January 4th, 2022. Thank you. The first thank day you. of 2022 was the all-time high, and then okay. all 2022 it slid. So what's remarkable about that, Michael, is that um, if you had been watching any of the news networks, mm -hmm. any of the business news networks, Bloomberg, CNBC, Fox Business, any of the above, or Wall Street Journal, I don't care where you went. The message was relatively consistent, not relatively, it was consistent. It was very consistent. Given what the Fed was doing, given the overstimulus, we were going into a recession, right? We were going to see a recession, inverted yield curve, all the fancy economic buzzwords and economic triggers Consumer and confidence PMI you everything. name it we heard it we were heading for a recession and and most money managers agreed and as a result got very defensive those stock pickers and market timers got defensive right and mm -hmm. and so we haven't seen that though did we we so not only have we not seen it it's been a one of the greatest starts to the year the first six months uh, through January through June that we've seen in a long time. So all those people on TV and, and writing newsletters and articles and everything saying, oh, this is a, they call it a dead cat bounce. When right. we have a recession and we get a little pop, they call it a dead cat bounce, kind of a gross term, but um, that's what they call it. And we're gonna see more pain and we're gonna see the October 22 lows again. And don't get too excited because this is not gonna last. Well, so far they've been wrong. So I know you're really sensitive, we are really sensitive of when we, point out people's predictions mm -hmm. and show that they were wrong. We are not making a prediction or suggesting we won't see a recession. Right. We don't know what we're gonna see. Right. Michael has his opinions, I have my opinions. <laughs> I think they're relatively pretty aligned right now. Probably. But it doesn't even matter. We're not even gonna share opinions cause, because it doesn't matter. And you'll notice our management style is not reflected on any sort of opinions or any bets or guesses, mm -hmm. right? We don't market time our investments, we market time where we pull our income from. Huge distinction, so we let the market do what it does, and we know over any extended period of time the market's gonna do really well. On In, average. On average, on average. So, 
But the thing we're going to hear a lot, Michael, is when, if and when, not if, but we're going to hear and have a recession. We're going to have a recession, whenever that is, especially if we hear it in the next, or see it in the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. All those people that have been predicting recessions, what they'll say is, I wasn't wrong, I was just early, right? <laughs> right? Which translation, you are wrong. You're not just early because anyone managing money who predicts we're gonna have a, a recession or a negative market event is getting defensive in their investment strategies. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they've missed all of this appreciation. And as a result, <laughs> when they hit the recession, they're gonna hit the recession, a lot of them, after having a massive a market event in 2022 that they missed on also. So it wasn't that they just were early. They were wrong and their performance will be impacted as a result. And that's why, you know, it's a game. It's 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 a we joke. try to remind people when we're allocating dollars at Fidelity or in plans, it is 100% based on your plan. Do we need these dollars later in life? Great, we're aggressive. Do we need these dollars early in life? Great, we're conservative. Let the market do its job. And that's really important just to bring this full circle in terms of reminding people why we are doing things in the plan that we're doing, whether it's hybrids, one by five, social security, pensions, Roth conversions, flight life insurance, whatever the questions are, people will say, well, you know, I don't really get this. Why does this make sense for this year? It's not about this year. It is about protecting people for this year, for next year, for the next five, 10, 20, 30 years. And that doesn't always click on day one but people have got to trust that everything we're doing for them today is done to protect them for the next 30 plus years of their lives. Well, you sort of teed this up for me, I, and I don't know that you meant to, but so I had mentioned today in this show, we, we've got, we've got a, show, a, a number of things we want to talk about, particularly the homework, stick around for the homework. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to take a little bit of a victory lap. And, and this is less about us bragging, but for some of our clients, not, I would say the minority of our clients, the majority of our clients recognize what we've done for them. Mm -hmm. There is a few who still like to challenge our strategies or beliefs. And when, some, when we do something that really impacts their retirement over a long period of time, if we do it well, we want to point it out so people understand. Like last year, here's the victory lap. Last year, the average portfolio around the U.S. was about down, lost in 2022, lost about 23%. Mm -hmm. If you were in fours, we noticed and had growth tilts, do-it-yourselfers saw much greater than a 23% and over a 30% decline. Mm -hmm. Now, we have saved every one of you. We've saved your retirements. And I know Michael probably isn't comfortable with me totally saying this, but we have saved you and you don't even know that we've saved you because none of our clients lost 23% last year. And if you had, you would have gotten pounded by sequence of returns risk and you would have had to change your spending for the rest of your life right. after 2022. None of our clients who were scheduled or planning to retire in 2020, 20, in 2022 they, the, none of them. No one delayed the retirement. No one, they all retired in 2022. You all continued to spend, travel. You are all continuing to spend and travel just as if 2022 never happened. A 23% market drawdown in your portfolio because your portfolio didn't lose that because we're constantly educating you and because we are income timing instead of market timing, your portfolios were significantly less impacted. And that is because, what Michael just said, we are, when we build your plan for you, we are planning to protect you now, in three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, events that Michael, I, our team know are going to happen. We know things that are going to happen throughout your retirement, for sure, because we've done this thousands of times. We know exactly how to protect you throughout your 30 year retirement, you don't. The frankly, your relationship with money is broken. Everyone's relationship with money, my own relationship with my own money is broken because it is difficult to not be, it's impossible to not be irrational about your own money, to allow emotions not to impact your decisions, right? Perfect, and you just teed me up for the rest of today's conversation because that emotional attachment, that emotional connection 
That is what drives the, the mistakes that people make based on I behavioral agree. finance. So I know, I know what you're doing. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> shuffle you along. I know bit. what you're doing. I, I want to just say one more thing. Yep. Why so many people were protected in 2022? I never said it. Mm -hmm. The reason why is you have 30, 40, 50% of your money not exposed to stocks or bonds, but in your hybrids, in your pension income. No, no, if you hadn't come to us and allowed us to build your plan, you would have had no place to hide in 2022. There was no, nowhere to go. Stocks, Stocks down, bonds, bonds down. Yep. all your 401ks, nowhere to hide. We saved your retirements by knowing that a market event like that would occur at some point in the first five to 10 years of retirement. So we positioned you properly. So when, when we tell you you're, you should be taking your Social Security at 67 instead of 70, or at 70 instead of 65, or you should have 30% of your money in hybrids, not 50%, or you should have life insurance in your retirement plan, even if legacy isn't important to you, it is because we are anticipating the risk that you're gonna be confronted with at some point over the next 5, 10, 15, 30 years, and it is our job to protect you for things that you aren't aware of, that you won't prepare for, that is our job and that's what we've done. And so, check a box, we saved you in 2022 for all the people that listen to us. Thank you for your trust, but please continue to trust us. This is our job to protect you. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Let's go on to emotions and how we're all broken with a relationship with money. So, I mean, I, I like the way you phrase that because it's really true. And that is, I always like to, in terms of behavioral finance, behavioral finance is a study of economics and it's really, it's a fairly new field of economics because the, the study of economics itself is built upon a singular assumption that consumers are rational. And yep. that's just not true. When it comes to money, people are not rational. People really have, and we have, we have two buttons in our brain, fear and greed. Research has told us that's, this. So we're not making this up. People this is are either the, pushing the fear button or the greed it. button. When people are at, see, oh, I think that stock's gonna go up 100% in the next year, they're pushing the greed button. I want more money. Yep. When people say, oh my gosh, um, I don't like the person who won the election. They're gonna crash the stock market. I'm gonna sell all my stocks. It's the fear button they're pushing. It's fear versus greed constantly. And when it comes to our money, it's an emotional topic and people make mistakes. And I don't care how logical someone thinks they are. Nope. And candidly, honestly, it's a little counterintuitive. The more logical someone thinks they are, yep. they're typically making even more emotional mistakes with their money. 100% because they're a little less insightful about their their emotions and anxieties and fears. And, 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 and then you combine that with this idea that once I retire and someone else isn't sending me a paycheck, then it's even more difficult to be rational and not mm -hmm. emotional about our finances. 100%. When bad things happen, we're gonna overreact. When good things happen, we're gonna overreact. We have to, that's our job, right? And so I wanna cover some of the main uh, behavioral issues that we see, with, and, and this isn't what we see, this is, you can Google these, they're everywhere in the world, but they really impact how people think about money and if we can help them course correct how they think about money, it can help them enjoy their plan, enjoy their retirement even more. I love it. So Let's first one, this is a, it's probably the most common one, and it is probably the one that pushes my buttons the most. It does. Is overconfidence bias. Oh man, I love when you meet with somebody, or after we teach a class, and, and that's there, wh whomever it is, that's there, and, and Michael just gets really frustrated by this. It's overconfidence bias, so just to break it down, obviously it's in the name, people who are overconfident, and people are very often overconfident about things that have happened that they think is based on their own skill. So the greatest example that we see it all the time in the classes are people who come to the class and they say, well, I have $5 million and I have that because I'm a fantastic investor. Yeah. I have, I've been stock picking, market timing my way to success and I'm really good, I have an edge, I have an algorithm, I'm really good at this. And I roll my eyes and I try to explain to that person, I don't mean to offend anyone, but no, you're not really good at this. Yes. You benefited, just like everyone else has benefited, from one of the greatest bull runs of all time. And people who are between 55 and 65 today got the extra benefit of they had that really amazing bull market towards the end of their accumulation period, yeah. which is when the compounding is the most powerful. 
Yes, and Michael, I, I want to make something clear, though, because I, I, don't, I don't know if you said this. I, I might have zoned out for a minute, but I want to make sure. The, the, those people, it's really our clients we're talking about, right? A lot of our clients who have been, you know, the do-it-yourselfers, the engineers, the CEOs, CFOs, these, these execs, they're really successful people mm -hmm. in their careers. 100%. And it, they're not overconfident. Many of them are just good. They, they should be. They're confident because they are... They, they have the capability. Like intelligent, successful That's people, it. 100%. 100%. When it comes to their finances and money, they are, we will say they're overconfident. Now, they've done some things well. They, they saved well, yep. better than most, yep. way, above, way above average. So they're much better at saving. They were disciplined. They often didn't panic when everyone else was panicking. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they did good things with their finances, but they got lucky in the timing of the bull market run at the end of their career, which was the greatest bull run in history. So that created this overconfidence, which will end up hurting a lot of people. It really does. And it, and it comes down to you know selective memory of someone going, well, I picked this stock and it's a home run. And I always love to give the example of my own mom. So yeah. the quick, st love you, mom, sorry. But my own mom likes to brag that she bought Apple, the Apple stock back in, I think it was like 2004. And she says, see, I picked a great stock. I'm good at this. And I tell her, mom, you got lucky. You're, you're being overconfident because it, her story is what in 2004, myself and all my friends, we all wanted iPods. And so she did some research and oh my gosh, these iPods are popular, who sells them? Apple does buy Apple stock. And so she said, that's me being in tune with the economy, in tune <laughs> with, with consumers and buying the stock and never panicking and holding it. And that's all great, well and good. It is but great. But I, I remind her, mom, I also, back in 2004, really wanted a Blackberry. And if you made me pick between an iPod or a Blackberry, I would have picked a Blackberry. And so if, you bought, if she bought stock based on what you know, my consumer preferences were in 2004, she would have bought RIM, the company who produced Blackberries, who they went bankrupt. Right. So she got lucky that she picked Apple. She did a good job holding on to it for still, she's still holding on to it. But that's not because she's a skilled investor. Michael, she got lucky. We, I want to move on to the next one. I want to just, just, just make this point that so many of these people that did really well and they're overconfident and they're investing, Many of them who retired over the last several years blew up. They just blew up their mm -hmm. retirement. A lot of the people you know, your friends, you've got family, who they've blown up their retirement. And here's the problem. Some of them are so overconfident, they don't realize, they don't understand sequence mm -hmm. of returns risk. They don't understand that that 30% loss, plus taking out their, whatever they're living on once they retire, they will not catch up. And it's going to catch up to them and they're going to run out of money. They've 100%. blown up their retirement. And that overconfidence for, for a lot of people follow them throughout retirement, it costs them greatly. Sorry. It really does. No, so let's jump on to the next one. The next one's also an excellent one, hindsight bias. And so hindsight bias, when something happens, it is human nature for us to look back and go, well, of course that was gonna happen. The writing was on the wall. And a really common one we see today is the 2008 housing crash. Yes. The, the, the housing crash, the stock market crash. I meet crash people all the time. I saw it coming. I knew it was going to come. And it's, it's just so, it's so funny because looking back, it is really obvious. People, they were giving out mortgages like candy to people, two, three, four mortgages. Sure. To people who didn't have a job, didn't have enough income, didn't have great credit. And so in hindsight, yeah, <clears throat> really obvious that this, that eventually was not going to be, wasn't going to last, was not sustainable, and was going to crash. And it did. But people today act like, oh, I saw that coming. Okay. No, you didn't. Because so, if you did, you would have been in the movie The Big Short, and they would have made the movie about you as well. <laughs> right. There were only a small handful of people who really saw that coming, and they made a movie about those people. And time out, Michael. And the other point is when you think you, when you do see something coming, and you do time it right, that's great. But you have to be then right to get back in. Yeah. So this is Michael's point always. He uses uh, the dot-com crisis all the time, where people were calling that a bubble many years prior to the actual bubble exploding. In like exploding. 94, 95. They, I mean, for many years, and if you had just stayed the course and rode through the run-up, then the bubble, and then came out the backside, you came out much further ahead than the person that was just early in their prediction, because right. I saw it coming, missing the last two to three years of that appreciation, and then, and also, when you get back in, we saw the same thing with COVID, people getting out, but many are still not even back in. 
right? Yeah. And so this hindsight bias is garbage. No one can predict when to get out. No one. It, 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 no one can predict when to get back in. Of course it was going to do that. Of course it was going to do that. That's, I mean, uh, one of the most famous people from the big short, the movie, yeah, from who, who he's, called it, Michael Berry. He's having some challenges. Is now famous because every 18 months or so, he makes a bold prediction about the new bubble. He's made calls in the price of water, the price of almonds. The, he, in 2018, the he was saying that index funds are causing the biggest bubble of all time. So now he's, in almost, 2018. he's almost addicted to calling the bubble because he, he, I mean, to his credit, he nailed it in he 2006, 2007. He nailed it. He was a smidge early, but I'll let, I mean, he was still, he's, he crushed it. And now he got all that fame, all that notoriety. He made all that money. Well, and now he's looking for the next one. And Michael, he called, didn't just call it. He didn't just get out, but he went short. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that's even double courage, right? None of, no one, and none he of crushed it, he but did. he's been looking for the next bubble to call. And he's called 10 since then. I'm making that up. Maybe seven or eight. I don't know. He's called a lot. And he's been, he's now he's 0 for 8, 0 for 9, 0 for 10 since then. And so that's why hindsight bias, it's, it's just be Nonsense. aware of that. It's, it's easy to look back and say, oh, I saw that coming. All right, Michael, so next one. Next See, I'm one, moving you on. I, know. I love this. Next one is your favorite, confirmation bias. You okay? I really want to get the hindsight bias today, too. I hope we don't run out of time. We just did hindsight Not bias. hindsight, anchoring bias. Yes, but, yes. Um, confirmation bias is, it, it is being so manipulated today, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this... I hope everyone understands what confirmation bias is at this point, right? Because go ahead and go on your smartphone, go on the computer, on any of your social media, on any of the search engines and start searching for information. So if you're a Democrat or environmentalist or a Republican or pro-choice or, or uh, Whatever, wherever you lean. Wherever you lean, start Googling those ads, articles about them, and then all of a sudden, every article you're going to see going forward, every story you're going to see is going to lean to the way your bias is. So now they are leveraging knowing that we have a bias, mm -hmm. and because we are look, we, we want confirmation bias, we gravitate to the information that reaffirms our beliefs so we can say, see, I was right. It makes us feel better about ourselves. I was right. Makes us be able to prove whoever disagrees with us that nope, I was right. So we're seeking out that information to affirm our bias. It's called confirmation bias. And what gets really scary is that, like, like you said, I mean, Google, social media sites, they're getting really good at shaping what you see based on what 100%. you search for, based on what they think you lean already. So for if we, if we think about this in financial terms, if someone is thinking, Great oh my points. gosh, I think we're gonna have a market crash. So that you're Googling market crash articles. Google goes, oh, they're scared. They're looking for market crash articles. Let's just flood them for the, Gold. Next, for the next month, three months, six months. Crypto. Let's keep flooding them with market crash articles because they're clicking on In all the ultra bears, there's a ton of guys and gals out there, experts that are bear, they're bears, meaning the market's gonna go down, mm -hmm. crash, always bear full. So, and they have incredible data and research. I mean, Michael sometimes comes, I just read this. I, I, there are, I mean, there are, like, there are really a story here, a podcast, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that person made like seven really good points in a row, and I'm now a little concerned. And I, I do some more research, and I'm like, okay, they twisted that fact, they twisted that data point, and you know, they have a couple of good points, but it's not as dire as they made it sound. They're really good at it, it's I their know. job. And so, I try to guard myself, I know you do as well, but in terms of confirmation bias, making sure we're getting information from everywhere to see as many points of view as we can, but it is difficult. It is, and in and, and, and trying not to allow our biases to influence, the, and we're really cautious about that mm -hmm. at our firm, because uh, we're not making calls, we're not right. making bets, but um, it's human nature. It really I, is. It is really human, and we gravitate to the people, the news shows, the channels, the friends that reaffirm our beliefs, and it's, it's probably not the healthiest way to live, but it's just how we live. It's how it's people It's hence why it's one of the biases. Yes. Now, next one is anchoring. Yeah, anchoring. It's so funny because we're seeing uh, quite a bit of this in our class. When people are coming to our class where mm -hmm. they're like, well, my portfolio was $3 million and I will get out and retire when I get back to $3 million because they went through 2022 and now that $3 million is only $2.4 Right, and just really quickly. So anchoring is when Sorry. someone 
grab, grabs onto a number, whether it was their previous portfolio all-time high number or whether you know 10 years ago they told themselves, once I hit $3 million, then I'll retire. They're anchoring to a number. That or a strategy or an investment or whatever investment thesis that they have. They're anchoring to something, whether it may or may not be the right tool for them to achieve what they want. So, and, and Michael, I think part of this, in, in part of the education in our classes, and, and we've done with our clients, and we do, I think, a pretty good job at this, is do you have what you need to give you what you want, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we meet people in the class and they say, you know, my portfolio was worth X, called three million, and after 2022, now I've got 2.2 million or 2.3 million, 2.4 million. I'll retire when I get the 3 million. And we say, well, what do you, why 3 million? Well, that, that's what I had. That's what I had, I want to get it back. Oh, and, and by the way, that was also my target that I said to myself, when I hit this number, I'll retire. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, the number's meaningless of what you have, it's what it will give you, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge for most people coming to the class is that they don't know if what they have will give them what they want. The financial service industry isn't going to tell them what they have will give them what they want because the more money that they manage of yours, the less money you s spend, the more money our industry makes, right? Mm -hmm. So that person with $3 million before 2022, now having $2.2 million only wants $120,000 a year to live on, that's all they, they want. They should re they're, they have way more than they need to give them what they want. They're, why are they work? They're anchored to a number and they won't come off of that number. I see this in real estate. In fact, I'm dealing with this right now with someone who has this bias that this, their, their property should be worth this number. Houses, uh, houses and, and real estate property. Businesses. Is famous for this. Businesses too. People attach their emotions. It's my business. It's my home. Who? cares i've got people haggling over fifty thousand dollars or or ten thousand dollars of equipment stupid things that does not change their lifestyle in retirement it's not even a rounding year they it won't cost them a dollar difference in their lifestyle in retirement it mm -hmm. can't do anything all they can do is hurt themselves if they don't just accept it take it, it's 50 grand i know i know when we say that it, it people are like fifty thousand dollars a lot of money well, it's not when you've got millions in it. Will you die with $50 million left at the end? 50,000. I'm sorry, 50,000 left at the end. The answer is no, you're going to have 500 at least left, 300 at least left when you die. That means it didn't change your life one way or another. You won't spend your money down low enough for these low numbers to make a difference. And this is when these biases get damaging to people's decision-making process. Now, thankfully, the plans help people to zoom out and see the whole picture and see the whole 30-year picture to yes. avoid these biases. But without a plan or if people don't understand their plan, they can't, it's, it's human nature to zoom in on one thing and let that one thing derail the whole process. It doesn't matter for all of our clients. It doesn't matter what something was worth six months ago, five years ago, two years ago. It doesn't matter what it was. What matters is, what do you need to give you what you want in retirement? That's what matters. And what the reality is today, especially today, because especially commercial properties, businesses, the credit markets are tightening. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling a little story here for a reason. Credit markets are tightening. If we have a recession and right now people can't borrow, those property values are going down. Not a little, a lot. A lot, something that is selling for 90 to $100 a foot today, just eight years ago was selling for $45 a foot. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna take much to get back down to that. Now, now, you had what you needed to give you what you want, but you were so anchored, and if something bad happens, now you don't get to have what you could have had. You don't have what you need to give you what you want. So that small piece could derail the whole thing. Everything. So change your relationship with money. Sorry. Yep. So I'll get these biases out of there. No more biases. We're out of time, uh, right? Uh, we have one more really quickly. Herd behavior. Oh yeah, herd so is herd good. So herd behavior is yeah. simply, you know, following the herd, following the rules of thumb. And people, the, the thought process is, well, if everyone is doing this, doing some, doing the four percent rule, the sixty forty portfolio, everyone taking must, Social Security at sixty six. Yes. 
taking social security the rules of thumb. whatever People must be doing these things because at some point someone did all the math and found the right answer and that's why the herd is following this well no people are following something becomes a rule of thumb because it's quick it's easy and people start to do it and everyone assumes it's the right thing that's for most people just following the herd when it comes to stuff like this is not the right thing i'll just i'll make it really really simple because i know the herd is what um what the entire financial service industry is hoping you follow mm -hmm. it they're manipulating it they're creating this herd mentality protect your principal, all the things that we talk about all the time. But I think our clients and people who watch our show are aware enough to understand that all of their pieces of retirement looks different than their neighbors, their friends, or anybody else they're reading about. Mm -hmm. and as a result, there is no herd to follow. There's no one that has the same picture you have. It's all very different. Tax, age, deferral, single, married, everything is different. So therefore, there is no one size that can fit any of you at this point in your lives. Hurt following is okay when you're amassing wealth and you're younger. That's not a horrible thing. Yeah, follow the herd in turn when you're growing the wealth when you're yes. younger. Stuff money into your indexes, ideally in the Roth side. The game has changed now. So I know we're running out of time we here. Are. So, so let's skip, they say. Well, so they say, it's a little bit of a cop-out, but they mm -hmm. say a lot of things. They say we're going to have a, have a crash. They say we're going to have a bull market. They say uh, so-and-so is going to win the election and it's going to do this to the stock market. No one knows. So instead nope. of making guesses and trying to invest based on those guesses, have the plan built, let the plan do its job, have your short-term money, your long-term money, let the pieces do their job, and call it a day. Yep, I love it. Um, homework. Homework, I think we wanted to do the 401k. Yep. Yeah, so, so I don't know what's happened, but for, so every quarter our team sends out an email to anyone that we are helping manage the outside 401ks. We're giving you investment. 401ks, 403bs, yes, thank you. all the fours. All the fours. So anytime we're provo providing you recommendations, um, which is anyone that has an outside 401k, we're doing that for. We need, our, our, our team is sending you an email every quarter to ask you to s upload your most recent statements. We need, from a compliance perspective, we have to have those statements. From in managing the investments, how are we in the plan? How are we closer to retirement? Should we be down, uh, reducing the risk exposure? Mm -hmm. We have to have those statements on a quarterly basis. Something happened. We were getting it regularly from most of our, our clients, but now it's not as frequent and in, in, it's slipping. So that's the homework. Please send us your most recent uh, four statements so that we can stay compliant and make sure it's still on course. And it couldn't hurt. People <clears throat> have been bringing to their account reviews their most recent social security estimates, which have been very helpful. Mm, good point. So please keep bringing those. And it also couldn't hurt to bring your fours statements to your account review as well. That, that's, that, that would help too, a, a great deal. Yep. Perfect. I hope you guys enjoyed this, this uh, rundown and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Take care.